Welcome to today's broadcast of Sun, Salt, and Light. Sun, Salt, and Light, S-O-N, knowing and growing in your daily relationship with Jesus Christ, but also being the salt and the light in your marriage, in your family, at your place of work, at your church, and even in the community you're in. I'm Pastor Michael Petit. This is a radio ministry of our church, Calvary Chapel Divine, here in Divine, Texas. We are so glad that you joined us for today's broadcast. We are a Calvary Chapel, so we simply teach the Bible verse by verse, chapter by chapter. We believe that God uses His Word to transform, restore, and to change lives one verse at a time. If you're visiting our area, you'd like to get information about our church or church service times, maybe even track down some of the other teachings that we have available through podcasts, whether it's through Audible or Spotify or Apple Podcasts, you can do all of that at our church website at calvarydivine.org. That's calvarydivine.org. And so we think sometimes marriage, and and I, coming from a, a child of divorce, we think that your marriage, hey, if we divorce... Some people think, well, it's better for us to wait till all the kids are out of the house and then we'll divorce. No. Or we'll divorce while they're young. No. It shouldn't even be, the D word should never even be brought up. If you're a follower of Christ, no. You see, we understand that divorce, divorce not only wrecks the child and his life, but it also destroys the peace of mind and the effectiveness with their friends and their family, their extended family. It impacts everybody. My wife was in uh, St. Petersburg near Sarasota in that area. My uncle Hayward lived there. Like she's in all the places I used to live. And she's like, well, what happened here? And I'm telling her, and she's like, what is wrong with your childhood? Divorce. It was divorce being passed from person to person. It affects and causes great pain. But see, one of the things we know is that with Abraham and Sarah, they doubted. And when you start doubting each other or you have doubts in your relationship or your marriage... They didn't trust God, so they doubted it. And so they came up with a master plan to lie. It's not a good plan. It causes great trouble. They could have prevented Sarah from having the child. There's so many things that Abraham could have done, but he didn't. And that's one of the saddest things in the world is to have a man who's the husband, who doesn't act. We talked about it this weekend, about being teachable. Men, you're to be teachable till you go home to be with the Lord. The thing that a marriage covenant, marriage, uh, marriage covenant does is it glorifies God. It should glorify God, and, and that's what we want in the church, but you cannot serve in ministry, regardless of what church you're in, if your marriage is a train wreck. Because it's it's not going to glorify God. Your marriage and your family need to be in order. It doesn't mean it's perfect. It just needs to be in order. Y'all all all running towards Christ. In Malachi chapter 2 verse 13 it says, In the second thing you do, you, you cover the Lord's altars with tears and weeping and groaning because He no longer regards the offering or accepts it with your favor your hand but you say why does he not because the Lord has uh, was witness between you and your wife of your of your youth to whom you have been faithless though she is your companion and your wife by covenant did he not make them one with a portion of the spirit in the union and what was the one God seeking godly offspring so guard yourself in your spirit Let no one of you be faithless to your wife of your youth. For the man who does not love his wife but divorces her, says the Lord, the God of Israel, covers his garments with violence, says the Lord of hosts. So guard yourself in in your spirit and do not be faithless. 
He's like, look, at the end of the day, it's like I've watched your marriage. Why? You're his children. He knows all the private stuff and the public stuff. He knows all of that. He's like, I've seen your tears and all your stuff, and you, man, where is that passion of your youth? Where is it? You're in a covenant with me. And that's no different if you're single or if you're a widow or if you're married or if you have children. You should have that same passion. That's the whole point of growing. It doesn't stop. And so in a, in a godly marriage, one of the things that, that I spoke about this past week and it hit me after service on Sunday about 1 o'clock in the morning, it woke me up. When I spoke about busyness and idleness, Now, you can be too busy and create idleness in certain areas of your life. You can be so busy that you, your, your time in the Word has gone idle, your time in prayer has gone idle, your time in fellowship has gone idle, your marriage has gone idle, or your family goes idle. Something's going to give. You cannot put your life on cruise control. That's what Abraham's doing. He didn't even go seek God before he goes. And then when he encounters Abimelech, he lies. Sarah lies. And they're in a sin that they did 20 years earlier. The other side of it, you can be idle and you'll neglect the word, your walk, your fellowship. You'll neglect your marriage, your family. Go ahead and keep being lazy. The devil loves it. Either one of those, and that's why I said you've got to find the balance of those two. You need to find the balance of those two. And you're speaking from somebody who struggles with busyness. That came from A.W. Tozer's book. And the way the Lord gave it to me, he's like, Mike, your marriage is with your wife has been 38 years coming up in May. But do not put your marriage on cruise control with the busyness of all these other things. Do not put your family on cruise control with the business of all these other things. Do not neglect your time with me, your time in the Word, your time in prayer, your time in fellowship. Well, I'm, I'm too tired. Why? You did it to yourself. You were too busy. But then there's the other side of it where you're too lazy. And you get idle. And you think, man, I'm just supposed to rest. And instead of a little period of rest, you take an extended period of rest. And it starts affecting all these other areas. And then that's when relational sin creeps in. And relational sin is not just in the church. Make sure you get that. It can happen in your family. It can happen in your marriage. It can happen with your friends. Relational sin is, is everywhere. And as followers of Christ, he's telling you, like, all that stuff has to be put away. And so... Where is your balance at? He, he talks about this in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 6. He says, As Sarah obeyed Abram, uh, Abraham, calling him Lord, and her children, if you, do not, if you do good and do not fear anything, that is frightening. He's like, Abraham was not the greatest husband, and yet Sarah followed him. She followed the authority of him. But she also lied with him. See, there's something that we need to catch in, in this as we think about. And one of the things I was doing, I had time, so I was trying to see when we were going to get done with First Peter. So I was reading ahead. And so Monday morning, I'm reading ahead, and 
I get to 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 7. And it says, Likewise, husbands, live with your wives in, a, in an understanding way, showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel, since they are heirs with you of the grace of life, so that your prayers may not be hindered. And I kept looking at it. I read it like four times, and I'm like, why is he not telling us to love her, but to honor her? Because Ephesians, he says love, right? And that, that, that I could not sleep. I'm up at 4 o'clock in the morning reading this thing, and I'm like, why is it, what does honor mean? He's like this understanding way. Like you, you understand, you need to know her. And he's like, you, you actually invest time in her and energy in her. And a husband should understand his wife's moods, feelings, and needs, and fears, and hopes. He also needs to be able to demonstrate and understand her heart. And know how she demonstrates love. Because she is the weaker vessel. And I love that he talks about understanding her. But he says the word honor. And the word honor actually means in the Greek, that she is of precious value. Precious value. There's no value that's so precious. And it's not what, what Abimelech's trying to pay her. This is why this all came to me. It was like, Abimelech's trying to pay, here's Sarah. She's worth this much money. No, she's not. She's precious. She's honor. She's of high value. You can't give me enough money for her. But there's something that you've got to catch in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 19. What does Peter talk about? But with the precious blood of Christ, like that of the Lamb without blemish or spot. The precious blood of Christ. Love her as Christ loved the church. Christ bled for the church and every drop of blood that hit the ground, whether it was from the beating or the scourging or from the cross, was precious. And you're to honor her and love her. And so Ephesians 5 and 1 Peter 3, love and honor go hand in hand. Paul and Peter had it right. And if you do not think that God's daughter has no value, then why are you married to her? She's precious. She's to be honored. Do you feel that, women? Because I wrote two things down. I'm going to read you Ephesians 5. It says, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by washing of the water with the word. Again, come to the water. Take her to the water, the living water, the word, and wash her with it, so that he might present the church to him in himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such blemish uh, or any such thing that she might be holy without blemish. Like, do you, do you make fun of your wife publicly? Because God knows what you're doing privately. You present her without spot or blemish as holy and honorable and loving. 
In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one has ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it. Just as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body, therefore a man shall, here we go with it, the oneness. Then, therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife. What are you holding on to, men? And the two shall become one flesh. And this is the beauty of all of this. The mystery is profound, and I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church because Christ is the groom and the bride is the church and your marriage is a covenant, and it's a picture of that. So how does it look? Because I can tell you the bride of Christ of, of the church is looking pretty rough right now. Especially the Western church. We have a lot of false teaching and things that just... He says, However, let each one of, of you love his wife as himself and let the wife see that she respects her husband. There's nothing routine about that. There's nothing routine about honoring and loving. Because if Abraham loved and honored Sarah, he would not have asked her to lie. He would have never went into Hagar. He would have referenced God. God came and talked to me. We fed him. We fed him. Remember, we fed him. We're going to have this baby. We don't need to lie. We need to pray before we go walk into the, wherever this next place is going. Like he, he's not seeking God in anything. And when you don't, men, when you don't seek God and you're just haphazardly making decisions, God help you in your marriage and your family. You need to be guided by God's Word and by the Holy Spirit. So women, as... I think about loving and honoring. Has your marriage become romance or routine? This was the other thing. And I'm like, man, baby, if you stay long any longer, I'm going to be writing a book soon. Because I got the chapters all ready to go. And it's true, when we think about romance or routine, what I'm saying is our, sometimes we get into the, the routine of marriage. Sometimes we get into the routine of family. Sometimes we get into the routine of our walk. But if they're precious and they, if they have honor, your relationship with God, and you love God, Shouldn't you pursue and, and have sacrifice for it? See, for men, one of the things I love is Boaz. Boaz's character in, in the book of Ruth, I, one of the things that it is said that, that Boaz was God's saturated man. Saturated. Dripping of God. That's what I pray for all of our men that you would be saturated, men of God. Boaz was a man who paid close attention to Ruth, but he also didn't let anybody say anything to her either. In Ruth chapter 2, verse 15 through 16, it says, When she rose to glean, Boaz instructed his young men, saying, Let her glean even among the sheaves, and do not reproach her, and also pull out some, of, uh, some from the bundles for her and leave it for her to glean. And do not rebuke her. Oh, don't you say anything. Right? It's a God-saturated man. He's making sure that, because he knows that, that, that she is not only taking care of herself, but she's feeding others. He knows her heart. And so marriage is made in heaven, but it's man's responsibility to maintain the work. 
We have maintenance work that is supposed to be done. And romance is not sex. Men? See, that's the first thing we think of. I'm going to take her out to dinner, but, you know, I'm going to have relations. Right? No. That's not it. It's, it's so much more than that. If you're honoring her and you're loving her, it's more than that. It's more than that. See, when I think of a romance, I, I, I think of the understanding of pursuit of her, of sacrificing for her, of nourishing her, and then the ultimate one that we're supposed to do, serve her. Right? But are we doing those things? Too many men today don't want to be married. And it's sad because there's a statistic that's out now that over 7 million men between the ages of 25 and 45 are either living at home with their parents and are not married or the wives are the breadwinners and they're absolutely okay with staying at home and not doing anything and that's not what God's called men to do we have a whole generation that grew up not knowing how to be men because there were no fathers in the home And you would think that they would be, with all this time, they would be learning a new language or taking care of the house or volunteering or doing something for, that serves others. But what do they do? They spend most of their time on porn. That's what the study came up with. That's sad. That's sad. They spend almost five and a half hours on their phones every day. And they don't put food on the table. And it tells us in Second Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 10, for even... When we were with you, we would give you this command. If anyone is not willing to work, let them not eat. But that's where we're at. And so I wanted to spend a little bit of time, not trying to beat y'all up, but to encourage y'all. Like when we get to, there will be times when I will always stop and look at a marriage in the Bible. It's just something I do because... I come from that. I understand what it is to have a broken marriage. I understand what it is to see God save a marriage and, and to overcome great hurt. There's nothing that me or Teresa did. It's what God did. That's what the Lord does. But it goes back to that verse in Isaiah 55. Do you come thirsty? Are you seeking Him daily? Are you worshiping Him? Now I ask that same question in your marriage. Do you come thirsty, seeking Him together? Do you worship Him together? A simple application. In John chapter 7, verses 37 and 38, it says, On the last day of the feast, the great, the great day, Jesus stood up and cried out, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes, in, whoever believes in me, as the Scripture has said, out of his heart will flow the rivers of living water. That's what my prayer is for you individually. That's what my prayer is for you for your marriage. That's what my prayer is for you, for your family, 
That's what my prayer is for you for this church and this community. That living waters would flow from you. And in your marriage. Like people are like, I don't know what's going on with their marriage, but it's different than this one over here. I like that. I want to say, what are y'all doing? Like, what are y'all doing differently? Disciple another couple that's young in faith and that may be struggling. Discipleship is not individual as well. It's, it's couples as well. It's families. Discipleship, we think that it's just it one-on-one. No, it's, it can be couples and it can also be families that you disciple. So do you have too much busyness going on in your life? And have you put something on cruise control? And you think, man, it's okay. It's going to be all right. And it's just like that yellow light. You know you're not supposed to run. But you're in cruise control. You're too busy to stop. Eventually, the red light's going to come. And if you don't watch out, you're going to crash. Too much busyness will always lead to something being neglected and idled. But too much idle can also cause the same problem. Don't let it affect your walk, your time in the Word, your time in prayer, your time in fellowship, your time as a couple, as a family. You have to invest in those things. I care more about you spending time in your marriage and your family because that's what makes the church healthy. Not serving the church. So if I tell you, you need to take a break. You need to go on vacation. There's a man back there that needs to go to Rockport and put a, put a fishing line in the water and take his wife to go see the beach. It's been time. It's been a while. I love him enough. He was here today serving, working. But I love them. And they would tell me the same thing. Because we love each other that way. They would tell me, Mike, you need to be, hey, that yellow light, wake up. We need to nourish and take time for our marriages. We all need that. We all need that quiet time. Right? Make that quiet time. I, I'm, I'm so disappointed in myself that I didn't have that, that. I was so busy. I was investing and studying and doing all those things, but man, within that quietness, it was just like, it, you know, it's, you have the faucet on. It's just a running, right? But man, this, this weekend, God opened a fire hydrant up. It was like, Phew. and I was like, wow. I remember this. And I'm praying that for you. I don't want you to, to not have that. Last thing. Has your marriage became routine? Have you lost the romance? Invest in your marriage. She is precious. She is of high value. You're to love her as Christ loved the church. You are to love and honor her. And within that, romance starts with the love, agape love, sacrificial love, honor, right? And I love that Peter used precious because he uses precious throughout the book of 1 Peter. Beautiful word. But then because you love and honor her, it equals you pursuing her, you sacrificing her for her, you nourishing her, you hearing her and you serving her. And let me tell you something. When that starts happening, let the romance begin. And, it, and, and what I mean by that is watch, watch what happens. Your family, they want to hang out with you. If you have a, a marriage as a train wreck, do you think your kids actually want to be around you? What do you think they're going to marry? Right? So, we look at Abraham and Sarah. Next week, we will watch them give birth. And some of y'all have, have been through that. Y'all know what it is to see a child be born and 
the beauty that's within that. But don't you want to be parents and grandparents that raise these kids up right? We have to fix the marriages. That's why I spent time with Abraham and Sarah. Because I don't know why that verse in 18 where it says, <laughs> like, Sarah, like it's Sarah messed up. And I was like, no, Abraham did too, man. They both did. They both did. Invest in your marriages, invest in your families, and make sure, most of all, your walk with God. Let's pray. Well, that concludes today's broadcast of Sun, Salt, and Light Radio. We hope that you enjoyed it. If you'd like to submit a prayer request or get in contact with us or find out service times, you can do all of that at our website, uh, as well as get uh, our podcast at Spotify, Audible, TuneIn Radio. Pretty much wherever you can find a podcast, uh, you, you can just type in Sun, Salt, and Light, and you'll find it. 